I think uh, majority of us are all here. I don't know, Kono, maybe if you're ready, you can start with the discussion. Okay. Um, let me pull my slides up, make sure that the screen is sharing appropriately. Okay, can everyone see the text? Look good? Yes. Okay, so um, we're gonna do chapter two today on statistical learning. Um, so we covered a little bit of this. I think, can I put stats or you just put stats in the chats? Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll, uh, mm. I lost my chat window. Um, I got it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, there it is. All right, all good. All right, so we're going to do chapter two today on the basics of statistical learning. We covered a little bit of this in chapter one last time, um, but we'll, we'll get into more of the basics and, and the details here. Um, so I'll go back and forth between the book and the um, the slides from the GitHub page. Um, more or less, why are we interested? Um, you can split it between inference and prediction. Um, either you're trying to figure out why something is happening or how much of something will happen or in a classification setting, what type of something. Um, so we have our Input variables and output variables. Um, inputs are, could be predictors, independent variables, features. There's a bunch of different names for them. Um, it all means the same thing, basically. And then the output variable is the variable of interest. There's a response or dependent variable because it depends on the input variables. Um, so the, that response variable is typically Y and the output or the, the input variables are typically X. Um, so this is an example from advertising data. Um, so sales versus 
um, various marketing inputs, so TV, radio, and newspaper. Um, let me go over here. Um, so we're trying to estimate sales and you can create you know, a function F that tries to estimate that as a function of newspaper, radio, and TV marketing. Um, and we, we're interested in how they operate together. Um, let me skip down a little bit here. Um, so, so this is the form that we're gonna see a lot. Um, so we have our dependent variable, we have our function that we're gonna estimate, we have our input variables, and then we have some error term. Um, so the point is to make new predictions of the dependent variable based on the input variables. Um, let's scroll down a little more. Um, so this is a, looks like a low S curve to me um, of some, some data points sampled from a function. Um, so the, the red points here are the independent observ or the individual observations and the blue line is the shape of the function curve. Um, and the black line shows how far the points are away from that curve. Um, that's sort of like the residual, which we'll get to, I guess, later on. Um, so why are we gonna estimate the function F? Um, as I said earlier, we can either do, either do it for prediction or inference. Um, and that's sort of the, also the breakdown between the classical statistics and then machine learning. Um, if you're interested in prediction, you're interested in, in accuracy of the estimate for the independent variable. Um, so in prediction, the function is, is sometimes treated as a black box. Um, we're not so much interested in the inner workings of the function. Um, we're just interested in, in the accurate outputs accurate predictions. Um, so we have Y hat, I've heard it called, which is the, the prediction that the function makes. Um, so there's two types of error, um, reducible error and, and irreducible error. Um, reducible error can be, that can be reduced by you know, improving the, the modeling method. Um, irreducible error is, more of the the inherent error in the data set. Um, so that's like your, I, I think about that as like the floor, or it, it puts a ceiling on your accuracy. Um, the other side of the coin is inference, where we're interested in, in the inner workings of the function. So we're interested in how the various input variables affect the response variables, how the X's affect Y. Um, here, we're not exactly interested in, in the, the, we're not only interested in, in the accuracy of the prediction for Y, um, but actually there, uh, I, I did the tidy modeling book last year and Max Kuhn had a good point in that book where um, he sort of challenges the idea that you can do good inference with a model that doesn't have good predictions. Because if, if your inference is based on a model that has really high error or doesn't fit the data very well, then he sort of questions that, that, that the inference is any good anyways. Um, but that's probably something for later on down the road. Um, so in, in inference, we're, we're interested in the relationship between the response and the predictors. Um, and here is where you just, the, the form of the function becomes more important. Um, if it's a linear model, then inference is a lot easier. Uh, but if you get into models that are more squiggly with degrees of freedom and things are on a curve, then it becomes much more difficult to explain what's going on in the function f. Um, so in the case of advertising, um, inference would be interested in which media type is more associated with, with an increase or decrease in sales. 
Um, and then you can get into various like, subsets of that question. Whereas in prediction, we just care about the accurate prediction of sales. Um, so how do we estimate F? Um, so there's parametric and non-parametric approaches. Parametric makes a upfront assumption about the form of F. And then once you assume that form, then you fit the model and, and make the predictions. Um, but if, if the form that you cho choose for F does not fit the, the underlying pattern of the data very well, then you're gonna have some challenges. So if, if, you're, if the actual data is nonlinear, like there's some curves or things like that, and you're trying to fit a linear model, um, you're gonna see a lot higher error but you can explain it better. Um, so this is sort of getting into the into the discussion on trade-offs, uh, but overfitting is where the model is is trained to reduce error in the training set, right? There's training and test sets, and most models, the algorithm is designed to reduce the error on the training set. Um, but there's definitely trade-offs there and you can overfit the model. So it learns, it, it mistakes noise for a signal and then tries to extrapolate that, that false signal onto the test set. Um, and that can cause real issues. Um, so non-parametric methods, um, where we don't make explicit assumptions about the, the function of the function f. Um, so, so so that, you know, instead of a linear model, you could fit a curve to it and you can make it as quickly as you want. Um, and that can fit more complex response variables. Um, but um, you need more data and the harder to interpret and the risk of overfitting is a lot higher. Let me go back to the book and see if I missed anything that I wanted to cover. Um, this was a fun plot. I thought it shows like the surface area of the of the of the function um, of of the one data set. Um, it's not something I see a lot in practice, but it's a cool cool visual. Um, Okay, so then we're getting into the trade off. Um, so, accuracy versus in interpretability. Um, I sort of think of the you know the basic model of like a basic linear regression is highly interpretable and XG boost is very much not interpretable. Um, those are like the two ends of the of the continuum that I see. I guess deep learning maybe as well. Um, so you can see that um, there's definitely a, a trade off between some of the the more restrained basic models that don't um, that are not very flexible. Um, you can interpret those, but then the the accuracy is, is not going to be as high if the data is you know has any complex patterns. Um, whereas something like deep learning or XG boost or, so, or something like that will have it'll be able to fit very interesting patterns in the data that you know, a line wouldn't be able to fit, um, but it'd be very difficult to, to interpret it. That interesting, interesting point about lasso being a, um, a less flexible approach than linear regression, that was sort of unintuitive to me, but I guess I can see where they're coming at. Because lasso, I guess it, it'll it'll 
restrain the coefficients on the on the input variables and and force some of them down to zero, right? Whereas a straight linear regression will not do that. So I guess their argument is that is that if you if the lasso forces some coefficients down to zero, you're basically removing variables from the model, which makes it more interpretable. Um, I sort of, I mean, that's probably true, but, but there's plus probably also other cases where the, the penalizer adjusts the coefficients, but doesn't force the, them all the way down to zero. And then you sort of have to explain to the, you know, maybe a business stakeholder or something about why that coefficient is not, you know, the way it is in a linear regression. Um, but, you know, that's by getting into the weeds. Um, okay, so the next uh, split we have here is uh, supervised versus unsupervised. Um, so supervised mean, means that, that, that a, a problem is supervised, supervised learning means that we have some source of truth that we can validate our model against, you know, in, in the advertising example, we, we, we know we have a sample of the data where we have the true number of sales. And we can fit a, a function f, estimating that that's that sales number, and then compare our prediction against the actual. Um, whereas in unsupervised problems, there's there there is no source of truth. There is no um, there is no actual. Right, you only have the input variables. There's no y. Um, so in that case, you're not you're not gonna use the same methods as you would in supervised learning. Um, and it's a much more, um, I don't know if analytical is the right word, but but it's a lot more, you have to really get a feel for the data um, because you're basically finding communities of interest or clusters or patterns without anything to validate against. Um, so I find that, that that takes just a lot more time to think through the problem. Um, is there anything in there? Yeah, so here we have, you know, clusters based on a couple of input variables with no, with no um, labeled data, with no label to, to validate the, the cluster against. There's no categorical variable that is serving as the response variable here. It's just, um, looking at the input variables and making clusters out of them, but with no way to validate them. Um, they had a section on semi-supervised learning where where there's some of the data has labels and some doesn't. Um, to me, that sounded more like a missing data problem. Like it's still supervised learning with missing data. I'm not sure what semi-supervised means there. Like to me, that's a problem of um, imputation um, as opposed to a whole different you know, paradigm, but um, Maybe I'm wrong there. Um, so regression versus classification. Um, to me, this boils down to the type of data in the response variable in the Y. Um, generally speaking, if the response variable is quantitative, then you're going to use regression. And if the response variable is qualitative, categorical, then it's going to be classification. Um, there's some overlap in, in the specific methods because some functions can do both, um, like tree models, things like that. Um, but you're in that case, you, know, you can use random forest to do regression or classification. Um, but 
if you're still choosing one. And that's driven by the response variable. Um, so um, model accuracy, this is the probably the biggest part of the chapter, I think. Um, so if, you know, this goes back to Max Kuhn's point, um, but you know, if, if you're, I think accuracy is still very important in, in inference and it's, it's the whole game in prediction, right? If you're, if you're, if it's a prediction problem, you're the only, only purpose is to create accurate predictions of why. Um, and if you're doing inference, then you need a model that, that explains a good portion of the variation in the data and has low error to have, you know, to, to have a reasonable chance at, at inference, I think. Um, so the author, authors make the point that um, there's no free lunch and you have to um, choose the model that, that fits the data the best. Um, I, I've heard some people say that on, on a sufficiently big enough data set, you could just throw XGBoost at it and not worry about trying different models. Um, I haven't been in that situation. Uh, but that's sort of interesting, interesting challenge, I think, to some of the the, the, the um, standard wisdom in the industry. Um, so mean squared error is one of the main metrics that people use to measure the accuracy of a model. Um, so here it's 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 measuring error. It's not measuring accuracy. So it's it's measuring how measuring the difference between the predicted response and the actual response. Um, so this is where we get really into overfitting. Um, so we use training data to fit the model, but we don't care about the accuracy on the training set. The, the accuracy or the, the error on the test set is what matters. Um, so, and again, I don't think I said this earlier, but but the, the model is trained on is trained on the training set, and then evaluated on the test set, right? So the model has not seen the test out of the four. Um, Let's skip, let's skip some stuff I want to get to. Um, yeah, and mean squared errors is a prob is a. I think overall, in general, you want to use some error term if you're evaluating a model, um, as opposed to something like R squared, um, which isn't actually a measure of error. Um, I've found some cases where if you try and optimize the model on R squared, um, things get swirly in a bad way. Um, so it's always good to focus on, on error. Um, so here's an example where he compares a couple models, um, a straight line, uh, a curve, and then a really squiggly curve. Um, and he shows that the um, the error on the orange line, straight line, is high in the test and train sets, or the training test sets, which you would expect because the underlying data is not a straight line. Um, the um, the second line, the black line, um, does better on both. But the um, the green line that that is has the most degrees of freedom, is the most squiggly, um, really has high accuracy on the training set. But when you when you apply that model to unseen data in this test set, the test accuracy or the test error drops because it overlearned the patterns in the training set. So it it it, it saw noise in the training set 
and thought it was stable. This is sort of the opposite example where the where the dad is more or less linear. Um, and the straight line does pretty well. And then when, when you overfit the data with something with a lot of degrees of freedom, you can see it. It's you know chasing that those dots around. Um, and it you know it's it's optimizing on the training data on the error or training error. Um, but then when, when you apply it to the test set here the test error increases. Um, so bias and variance. So you can, um, sort of describe models in terms of bias and variance. Um, parametric models will have higher bias because they make an assumption about the underlying shape of the data. Um, so something like linear model is high bias because um, it, it draws a line of best fit through all the, all the data. It doesn't try and chase individual observations. Whereas on something like deep learning or SG boost, um, is higher variance and low bias, um, and so well, it could be it could be low in both. But you know, something like like XGBoost will deal with interesting patterns in the data that are nonlinear better. Um, so the challenge lies in finding a model where both the variance and the bias are low. Um, so that was all for regression in terms of how we talk about error. Um, in classification, we have the error rate where um, you're basically calculating whether the predicted class of the dependent variable was correct or not. So again, it's divided into training, error, and test error. Um, so the base classifier is, is sort of an interesting idea. It's the hypothetical gold standard. Um, and I've, I, it basically takes the majority class and then assumes that, that everything else will be that majority class. Um, so this is a classification problem with two classes and the purple dotted line here is the base decision boundary. You can see that it does a pretty good job. There's some misses here and here, um, but it describes the, the pattern pretty well. So that's the, yeah, the boundary is, is where the, the predicted probability is exactly 50%. Um, so here we get into our in, into a new model type. It's K nearest neighbors. Um, so um, what it does is it looks at, um, It finds that the nearest k points, and k is some integer that you define, which you can tune, um, and then looks at the at the distance between those points, and then uses that to make predictions about the rest of the of the data. Um, so here, the k is three. So if it finds the three nearest points, and then uses that to draw. The, the decision boundary around the rest of the points to classify them. Um, and again, we get into the into the problem of degrees of freedom and um, overfitting. Um, so if K is 10, 
then it can look at a whole lot more of the data in the training set. Uh, but you can see that it, it takes some funny turns here and there um, and is mistaking noise for signal. So, so when that's applied to the test set, um, it's going to make some mistakes. Um, so I think I said it backwards earlier, but yeah, if K is, if K is one, then it's, it's, it's only looking at one data point. Whereas K is a hundred, then it's looking at too many and it's basically drawing a straight line. And again, the purple one is the, the base boundary. And again, we see that U shape in the test error. So as you increase K, um, you're going to drive down the training data and the training data will, will always decrease as you increase to, uh, degrees of freedom, basically. Um, but then you'll see that U shape in the test error. So as the model becomes more flexible, more complicated, um, it starts mistaking noise for signal. Let's see if there's anything else in the book. Yeah. All right. So that, that's the that's the section of the book there, chapter two. Uh, the rest is the labs and the um, and the exercises. I don't know how we wanted to handle the exercises. Um, we can talk through them or, or, uh, or, 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 or